left your castle, went to work because my sister needed to go to college. So I had to work. My dad could not afford to send both of us off to college or university at the same time. She went off to teacher's college, Jamaica. I went to work, decided I would work for three years and save enough money to go back to college. Three years turned into 11. I left without a job in 1994, decided that I was gonna go back to school. So at 29 years old in shoes and socks, I was back at the Brownstone Community College with 16, 17, 18 year olds, fresh coming out of high school with their CAPE and their CSEC subjects, bright students. I remember during the orientation, I felt so intimidated. This mother of two in shoes and socks at 29 years old in this auditorium with all these young people, I felt like I was their mother. I remember I turned to the coordinator of the program and I said to her, I don't believe that I can manage this about the third year of orientation. And um, they referred me to the principal. I spoke with the principal and he deterred me. He said, no, don't quit. Give it your best shot. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. My name is Colette from Dr. Colette J.A. Smith and Associates. This morning I'm having a conversation with you. I just want to keep it as real and authentic as I can. I was in a leadership session this morning. It's a global world business executive coaching summit. It is a one year program. It started in May, the pre summit, and concludes in April of 2021. Excellent program. I would highly recommend it to anyone who is interested in coaching and supporting executives. I believe they have a new summit starting shortly. But my purpose for bringing this video to you this morning is really just to outline what I do and just to share a little bit about the discussion this morning. The topic was really looking at how we can coach leaders in the 21st century to deal with the challenges and to create powerful teams. Uh, the essence of the session was really to discuss how best can we empower leaders. One person in the session this morning decided that Leadership is really not about influencing. Each person should be able to just come to the workplace and do what he or she is supposed to be doing or perhaps feels like doing without having anyone so-called uh, influencing them. I beg to disagree with that statement. Having been involved in leadership since 1991 in my first junior executive job at Cape Town Wireless and having trained and developed leaders for the last 20 years or more, I know that leadership is defined as the process of influencing and directing the task-related activities of group members, but it is more than just influencing and directing, it is really about motivating people to perform, whether they are going to be performing voluntarily or they are going to be performing for remuneration. The essence of the summary of that session was that most of the coaches in that session came to the understanding and the agreement that leadership is really about influence. One of the leadership gurus that I like to reference is John Maxwell. And at the very beginning of this book, The 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader, John Maxwell makes a pretty profound statement about leadership that I would like to share with you. He starts out by talking about the character of leaders and he says, be a piece of the rock. Leadership is a capacity and will to rally men and women to a common purpose and the character which inspires confidence. He was quoting Bernard Montgomery, British Field Marshal in that statement. And then John Maxwell went on to outline the 21 indispensable qualities of a leader and they are as follows. I won't go into the details today because I can do other videos on each of the qualities that he highlights. But just to introduce you to them, he says character, be a piece of the rock. Charisma, the first impression can seal the deal. Commitment, it separates doers from dreamers. Communication, without it, you travel alone. Competence, if you build it, they will come. Courage, one person with courage is a majority. Discernment, Put an end to unsolved mysteries. Focus, the sharper it is, the sharper you are. Generosity, your candle loses nothing when it lights another. And persons who follow me on social media know that I love to quote this. Your candle loses nothing when it lights another. 
meaning that we should always be open to empower other persons because we are building a stronger community, organization, church, school, work, society by helping others to be empowered. Initiative, you won't leave home without it. Then we're looking at the 11th indispensable quality. Listening, to connect with their hearts, use your ears. So we have to be effective listeners. When your team members are speaking with you leaders, listen with your eyes, listen with your heart, and listen with your ears. I'm doing an in-depth study on the brain. And what I have discovered since the last 20 years or so, neurologists have discovered that there are neurons connected to the brain in our hearts and in our guts. So we have a tendency to say, I have a gut feeling about this thing. Yes, there is in fact a connection between your brain and your gut as well as your heart. So listen to connect with their hearts, use your ears. Passion number 12, take this life and love it. Positive attitude, if you believe you can, you can. Problem solving, you can't let your problem be a problem. Relationships, if you get along, they'll go along. And that goes without saying. Responsibility. If you won't carry the ball, you can't lead the team. You must be willing to roll up your sleeves and get involved with your team. Otherwise, you are not going to be truly motivating your team and getting them to that point of intrinsic motivation where they see something to be done and they just do it, even without you having to tell them. Security. Competence never compensates for insecurity. So it doesn't matter how much expertise or skills you have. If you are insecure, you are going to have a challenge leading people. Self-discipline, the first person you lead is you. So you must be disciplined. How you manage time, how you conduct yourself, how you relate to others. Servanthood, to get ahead, put others first. Teachability, to keep leading, keep learning. Vision, 21 and final, you can seize only what you can see. Now, I operate a training and consultancy practice through which I train leaders and their teams. I'm adding coaching to my menu of services. I have been teaching persons how to coach in the art of effective leadership. It is a program that I rolled out in 2006 to Super Clubs. This was my first manual that I rolled out to Super Clubs in 2006. And since then, I have done further studies. At that time, I had just completed the master's degree, bachelor's and master's degrees. Now, I have completed a PhD in governance. And we know that governance comes from the Latin word governance, which means to steer or captain a ship. So leaders must recognize that their hands are on the wheel and they are taking that ship, the organization or the team in a particular direction. So they must ensure that they display all of these 21 indispensable qualities that John Maxwell and others outlined. I try to keep up with the latest technology and the latest perspectives on leadership by reading every day, the Harvard Business Review, uh, Bloomberg, and other resources to make sure that I remain on the cutting edge. If I'm going to be training leaders, 21st century leaders, I have to make sure that I am ahead of the game in terms of the knowledge base that I am building on and in terms of the skills that I want to impart to executives and their teams. Another manual that I wrote, and I customized manuals for each of my training, this was Igniting a Fire in Your Team. This was a presentation I made to the RGR Communications Group, uh, Mr. Gary Allen and his team. Now, the Brownstone Community College has also utilized my services, and the Brownstone Community College is one of the schools I attended. I am a proud alum of the Brownstone Community College. Very, 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 very good organization in Brownstone St. Anne. And I'm very, very happy to say that they called me back, having completed the PhD, to do a strategic planning session with their leaders, their heads of department and their teams. And this was the manual that I created for them, taking the Brownstone Community College from good to great. The great James Walsh, 
was the principal at the time and Mr. Walsh had a popular saying we are going to be taking straw and turning them into gold so irrespective of the stage at which the student came in at the time when Mr. Walsh was a principal we recognized that this student was really someone with potential and as long as a teachers lecturers professors we did everything that we needed to do then we could help that person to go to the peak of Maslow's hierarchy self-actualization and then I do quite a bit of training as well. I specialize in diamond and star rated hotels. I do not really go for all properties because I want to make sure that I work with organizations that will be committed to high standards. So I have a tendency not to go for the discount hotels or the low value hotels because sometimes you will do the training or you will do the executive development program and you find that if the standards are not maintained then it can damage your brand so i tend to stick with the five star five diamond five star four diamond hotels so this is one of the manuals i've used with that particular group of hotels it is the art of effective leadership for supervisors and executives and the content of this manual we look for example at what is leadership we look at popular leadership styles leadership traits leadership personality is the future of leadership what management is and what management is not we look at the functions of management planning leading organizing and controlling and we elaborate on those and how each of those will tie back into the mission and the vision of the organization we look at understanding the psychology of your people roles responsibilities and expectations of the executive and his team leadership authority we look at authority of position authority of knowledge and expertise authority of behavior and performance authority of trust then we look at delegation as a tool skill and process delegation explained the advantages of delegation guidelines for effective delegation we look at leadership and motivation taking it from the traditional views of motivation to the human relations model the human resources model theory x and theory y business students and management study students will be familiar with all of these content theories of motivation maslow's hierarchy and staff motivation tips on motivating diverse individuals and lessons from john maxwell's 21 indispensable qualities then i look at written communication communication and I coach those managers into how to communicate effectively particularly in writing if you're going to be for example writing a letter of reprimand as a leader or a manager you do not want to write a letter of reprimand or even a letter of commendation or recommendation letter that's going to make you the laughing stock so I coach managers through into how to write effectively uh, properly structured letters and other forms of communicate whether that be a notice or a memo all right we also look at activating the vision the mission and the philosophy and values of the organization as we go through this pandemic we realize that many organizations would have outlined visions that have been affected significantly by the pandemic so it is no time to recalibrate that vision to revisit that vision to see whether or not you really are able to attain that vision or perhaps you should revisit that vision recalibrate that vision to make it more realistic you find that organizational structures are changing you find that organizational functions are changing and you find that even the brick and mortar setup of organization has now changed to either a hybrid of brick and mortar face-to-face -face operation and work from home operation or strictly work from home operation there are advantages to working from home for organizations in that they are reducing the cost of your operation because you do not necessarily have the staff in the office and the overheads associated with that particularly for organizations that provide additional benefits like lunches breaks gym facilities uh, daycare facilities and so on for their staff you find that a lot of that is no longer on the plate as I am talking about working from home I would also want to recommend to leaders that you look at how you can increase the remuneration of the teams that are working effectively from home so that you can compensate or offset part of their cost of working from home because home now is becoming an extension of the workplace thanks in advance for considering that so we look at 
aligning yourself with the vision, with the mission and the values of the organization and ensuring through HR that when you are employing your team members, you are employing persons by looking at the skills and the characteristics and the values that will align them well with your organization, with your vision, with your mission and with your core values. All right. This is another manual that I wrote for another organization. They were facing some industrial relations problems. And so after having sat with the executive team, I came up with some recommendations as to how we could deal with those industrial relations problems. I taught industrial relations in the HR degree program at the Turks and Caicos Islands Community College, along with international business and other courses. I also taught at the University of the West Indies as a local tutor in the University of the West Indies Distance Education Center for four years from 1999 to 2004 in the Bachelor of Management Studies and Bachelor of Education programs. So having done that, I recognize that it's important not to just for HR managers and directors to be familiar with industrial relations, but leaders themselves should be familiar with industrial relations and how to manage people according to the laws, the legislation that is in place. One of the courses I taught was also Caribbean Industrial Relations, so I had to familiarize all of my bachelor's students with the laws across the Caribbean region with regards to IR, Industrial Relations. So the content of this uh, manual, Communication, Conflict, Management and Leadership, uh, we looked at effective communication for leaders. We looked at conflict resolution, introduction to human resource management and industrial relations, the role of the manager in conflict resolution, conflict and grievance defined, what is industrial conflict, informal versus formal industrial conflict, impact of conflict on performance, some ethical considerations for minimizing conflict in the workplace with reference to the International Labour Organization. And we also looked at the importance of being a leader and what is your role as a leader to ensure that conflict is minimized. We looked at effective communication. We looked at leading by example, and we closed on branding and image. All right. I also do quite a bit of training in customer service. So customer service management, customer relationship management, sales and relationship management, after sales service and handling complaints. So this is one of the manuals that I have used. And I had used this with Bailey Terrell and Allen. It's a law firm in Kingston, Jamaica, quite a popular law firm. One of the partners in that firm is now a minister of government. All right, so it's delightful customer service for customer to contact employees. And the content of the manual is dependent on what are the issues to be covered for each firm, for each organization. For this particular organization, we looked at the customer service revolution, who is a customer, factors affecting customer service, attitudes appropriate to customer relations, behavior patterns. We looked at factors that satisfy customers, managing customers' behavior, challenging customers and how to handle them. And we looked at each type of challenging customer because I find that in customer service, you can employ persons who are very, very polite, very courteous, but when they meet upon persons that are challenging, then sometimes they are not able to handle those issues. So we outline the characteristics of each type of challenging customer and we provide what I like to call a prescription as to how to deal with these customers so that they end up not just satisfied but also delighted. We look at communication, all forms of communication, body language, nonverbal, verbal communication. We looked at teamwork and we looked at other factors to ensure that the organization remains not just viable but sustainable. So a little bit about my background, born in Kingston, Jamaica, started school, primary school, Old Harbour Primary, lived with my grand for a while, my parents separated, moved from Old Harbour to St. Anne, went to St. Anne's Bay Primary School in grade two, left the St. Anne's Bay Primary School to the York Castle High School, my alma mater is also the high school that our latest 2020 Rhodes Scholar, Fitzroy Wickham, graduated from. He was head boy there. Very proud of your castle, that school on the hill. And left your castle, went to work because my sister needed to go to college. So I had to work. My dad could not afford to send both of us off to college or university at the same time. She went off to Teachers College, Jamaica. I went to work, decided I would work for three years and save enough money to go back to college. Three years turned into 11. Spent eight years as a telephone operator repair service clerk. 
during that time I demonstrated some leadership skills by using my initiative and was promoted to the junior executive level. I remember when I went for the interview for that junior executive position when cellular services were just being introduced into Jamaica. There were persons there with diplomas, bachelors and master's degrees, but I went into that program, went into the interview process with confidence. I answered all the questions. I was able to pull forward how I had used my initiative in leadership, although I was not a formal leader, a formal supervisor. and. The long and the short of it is I got the job and I was able to turn that particular office into the model office for the group as far as cellular services were concerned. I left without a job in 1994, decided that I was going to go back to school. So at 29 years old in shoes and socks, I was back at the Brownstone Community College with 16, 17, 18 year olds fresh coming out of high school with their CAPE and their CSEC subjects, bright students. I remember during the orientation, I felt so intimidated. This mother of two in shoes and socks at 29 years old in this auditorium with all these young people, I felt like I was their mother. I remember I turned to the coordinator of the program and I said to her, I don't believe that I can manage this. About the third year of orientation. And um, they referred me to the principal. I spoke with the principal and he deterred me. He said, no, don't quit. Give it your best shot. I gave it my best shot. I remember many times I had to be recording my notes. Some persons may have heard this story before on TDK cassettes. Thank God for TDK. I have a whole bunch of them up there. I could show them to you another day. I uh, recorded my notes, so when I was attending to the family, I would record my notes and I would listen to my notes while I'm cooking or while I'm helping the children with their homework or I'm bathing them or I'm washing or pressing, whatever it is that I was doing, I would ensure that I'm listening to my notes. That worked out to my benefit because of the constraints I had in terms of time. I was forced to study every evening by recording my notes and listening to my notes, going to school in the bus and coming back from school in the bus in the evenings. Uh, at the end of the two years of the three-year diploma program, UTEC was offering that program, two years in Brownstone, final year in UTEC, I ended up with the two academic awards, to God be the glory, the Adbar Limited Award and the George Thompson Award for Academic Excellence. Not because I was the brightest person, there were students brighter than I was, but because I was disciplined and I was determined to make the best use of the opportunity that I had to pay for out of the money that I had saved over 11 years of working. Completed the diploma program, decided that I would continue to the bachelor's degree program because I was being encouraged now by my lecturers and professors to just go ahead and finish the bachelor's degree. So I went ahead, completed the bachelor's degree in 1999, and to God be the glory again, even with major challenges and having to move off of campus to come home because of a domestic issue, I was able to travel every single day during exams. To Kingston, I remember I fell asleep sometimes on the bus. I remember Mackie, the guy in the bus park, would save a seat for me in the mornings and he would make sure that I'm comfortable. God bless Mackie, Mackie is still in the bus park. I've seen him, I've encouraged him and I need to keep in touch with him because many times I would have been left behind if Mackie didn't find a seat on the bus for me to get to school to do my exams. Completed those exams at UTEC and I ended up with the BOJ and UTEC Award for Academic Excellence. Completed that, went on to UWE, completed a master's in tourism and hospitality management because, you know, in the Caribbean region, we're heavily dependent on tourism. And I did not want to just be helping persons in tourism and not understanding the fundamentals of tourism and hospitality management, particularly sustainable tourism development. So when I went into the master's program, I specialized in sustainable tourism development because environmental preservation and long-term policy making were very, very important to me. And so thank God for Professor Clayton, who was my sustainable development lecturer and who ended up being my PhD supervisor for my PhD in sustainable development, focusing on governance and public debt management was one of the persons who influenced me significantly to focus on sustainability. Many times when people hear about sustainability and you think about the sustainable development goals, persons think about the environment and environmental preservation. Sustainability is more than that. It is really about long-term planning, 
that will enhance the chances of survival and thriving of future generations. According to the Broadland Commission, and I'm reading for my PhD thesis, according to the Broadland Commission 1987, sustainable development results in progressive transformation of societies and economies and can be pursued multidimensionally from social, political, and physical paths, recognizing the importance of inter- and intragenerational equity. Implicitly, therefore, the burden of debt incurred by present generations ought not to be borne by a future generation unless a corresponding accumulation of assets is also transferred. So when we talk about sustainable development, we really are looking at the kind of development and the kind of policies and the kind of legislation that is put in place to ensure that we consider the future generations, those to whom we're gonna be handing the baton to make sure they have the resources to have an even better life than we have, to make sure that whatever resources we hand over to them, we hand over the resources in such a condition that is even better than the condition that we receive them. So we want to make sure when we talk about sustainable development that we are not just looking at the environment, but we are looking at policies that will have long-term effect. As we talk about this PhD thesis, I'm about wrapping up a book for publishing. My professors, the supervisors and examiners thought it was an excellent uh, piece of work. And so they have recommended that I publish, but take all the technical aspects to make sure that it is an easy read for the average person. So in this particular study, I looked at the an introduction statement, the conceptual framework. So we have to go through the literature. We have to go through all of the work that was done prior in this particular area. If there was no work that was done, we must substantiate why we think that no work of this nature has been done by juxtaposing the outline for this work against what we have found in the literature. So I had to do an extensive review of related literature and actually had to do an examination of directed readings at the Salises Sir Arthur Lewis Institute uh, for Sustainable Development. Very, very happy for the University of the West Indies and the wonderful staff at Salises that facilitated me as I conducted my research from 2009 to 2014. So we looked at governance, sustainable development. We looked at the role of government. We looked at the electoral system and governance. We looked at public policy, managing the governance process. We looked at moving from public policy to public choice. We looked at from public choice to the new institutional economics framework. We looked at heterodox and orthodox perspectives on governance. We looked at development and growth. We looked at early influences on development and growth in Jamaica. We looked at the Harrod Domar model, growth through savings and investment. The Sir Arthur Lewis model, growth through structural transformation. We looked at what NERCs had to say, growth through human capital development. We looked at the plantation economy perspectives. We also looked at dependency theories and other theories of public finance. Having completed that, we also looked, because we're looking at public debt, we looked at financing through signage and in terms of um, printing money and that kind of thing, and financing through taxation, deficit financing, looking at what Ricardo and Barrow, the gurus in this particular area, had to say about deficit financing. We looked at Tobin's portfolio management approach. We looked at Booth and Reed and what they had to say about the cost minimization approach of deficit financing. We looked at component structure and cost of debt. We looked at budget deficits, inflation and debt. Excuse any noise you hear in the background because I'm actually recording this particular video close to the public thoroughfare. All right, so this particular book that will be published will be really a reference tool or a blueprint for governments not just in developing countries but governments globally because it looks at the UN characteristics of governance and how those can be applied to your operation and your leadership of a particular country or jurisdiction to ensure that you make decisions that are in the best interest of the many rather than the few. Since I'm talking about um, some of the works that I've done, I also would like to introduce you to my master's thesis, the characteristics and interests of visitors to heritage sites. And here I looked at three particular heritage sites. I looked at the Bob Marley Museum, I looked at the Civil Great House, and I looked at the Rose Hall Great House. And we have some empirical findings because we actually conducted surveys amongst visitors to the heritage sites 
to determine their spending power, their educational background, and other demographic details. We looked at the factors that caused them to choose to take a tour to those sites, and we provided a copy of this to the team at the Civil Heritage site so that the government can have access to the data to diversify Jamaica's tourism product. A lot of the information that I'm sharing with you has been shared with different areas of government. One of the other works I want to introduce to you is this study that we had to complete for the bachelor's degree program at the University of Technology. My partners in this study were Huntley D. Brown, Tevely L. Grant, and yours truly. We looked at the recruitment and the selection policies and practices of the Jamaica Constabulary Force. And we did a study in area two covering St. Anne, St. Mary, and the borders of Trelawney. We conducted surveys and interviews with police officers at different ranks, and we concluded our study based on a thorough research of the literature and the findings from the surveys and interviews. We submitted a copy of this to the police academy in Kingston because even as early as a bachelor's degree program, we wanted to be able to contribute to public policy and the decision making pertaining to our security forces and ensuring that there were strong HR principles applied to the selection and recruitment process. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time to watch this video. It has been an awesome pleasure just sharing a little bit of what I do, a little bit of my work with you. I hope that this information will help to inform some of your decisions. I can be reached on cjasconsults at yahoo.com. That's C-J-A-S-C-O-N-S-U-L-T-S at yahoo.com or 1-876-313-6827. The organization is registered, duly registered and tax compliant as Dr. Collette J.A. Smith and Associates and I can be reached anywhere in the world and I can provide my services anywhere in the world as long as you are accessible via the internet and the network that is used to facilitate training, consultancy and development. Thank you.